Oh, hi. Um, sorry, I was taking a nap. Um, it's been very busy with the, uh, with the MOOC, uh, taking care of the MOOC. The whole team has been working long hours to make sure everything is, is taken care of. So far, nearly 40,000 people registered for this course. So we've been, um, yeah, we've been doing a lot of work to make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, thank you for the support so far. We really appreciate it. Um, you also have quite a lot of questions that have been raised on the discussion forum. And we'd like to take the opportunity at the, at the end of the uh, first week to address some of those questions. Um, and uh, I'd like to do that in, in a video. And one of the things that, uh, that you raised was uh, how can we find or where can we find al alternative sources of information about, uh, about nutrition and about nutrition health in, in particular. Now, one uh, important source is, is PubMed uh, Health and, and Medline Plus, which is a service run by the uh, National Institute of Health in the, in the United States. And they provide a lot of information about, about health in general um, and, and various diseases, but also about nutrition. So you, you should check that out if you want to know more. Um, there is also the uh, Nutrition Source, which is run by uh, Harvard University. Provides a lot of information about nutrition, uh, about nutrition health. It's a little bit biased towards uh, research performed at Harvard, uh, but that, of course, makes, uh, makes perfect sense. Um, that's, that's a really good source as well. The British Nutrition Foundation has a very accessible, very, very colorful website that you should check out. Uh, lots of information there as well. And don't underestimate uh, Wikipedia. Um, some people have questions about Wikipedia, but in general, it, it is quite accurate. And also about nutrition and health, some of these entries are really extensive and, and very detailed and, and actually very good. Um, so don't underestimate uh, Wikipedia. Um, and there are a lot of other uh, legitimate organizations, the American Heart Association or the American Diabetes Association, Organizations like that that um, provide very reliable information about uh, their diseases, but also about the impact of nutrition on those diseases. Now, at the same time, there are numerous websites that are very, very questionable. And I can't mention all of them, but there's one in particular that was also raised by somebody on the, on the, uh, on the forum. And that's a website run by uh, Dr. Joseph uh, Merkula. And uh, he's a very questionable figure uh, who has been reprimanded uh, numerous times, and uh, most of the information that he disseminates is is not science based i don 't know where it, what he bases his information on and his uh, his claims uh, but uh, please uh, avoid it um, and there are many other sites like that. If you find sites that say at uh, top ten reasons why you shouldn 't eat uh, this or that or top three and ten reasons why you should eat a lot of this. Uh, those usually are not very evidence-based. Um, if they use words like toxin uh, or, or poisonous, uh, things like that, uh, that are really extreme, um, then you usually you should also be very careful in, uh, in interpreting and, and taking up that information. Um, so in general, there's a lot of good information out there. Uh, but if it sounds too good to be true, if it sounds too extreme, then, then always be careful. And, and then you can always go back to the, the sites that I mentioned at the beginning to figure it out. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can always, uh, of course, address us. Huh? You can uh, post a question on the discussion forum. We'll, uh, we'll try to get back to you either in writing or if, if many people raise this question, at the end of the week we, we combine them and we'll answer them in a setting like, uh, like this one, and hopefully that will uh, provide good answers uh, for you. Now, one of the other issues that was raised in the discussion forum was how did we get to the information that is presented in the MOOC? And I would like to uh, discuss with you the, the, the processes, how we scientists collect information and how we assemble that and how we, how we put that out and how it ends up in a MOOC or in a, in a textbook. And of course, it's all based on, on scientific discovery. People do experiments, and, and they, uh, uh, they f have a certain result. Uh, there's a certain finding. And of course, we need to be very careful in interpreting these individual findings, these individual studies. Uh, they can be very informative, but uh, they're still individual studies. They're single studies. 
And what is important is to put that in a more global context. How does it relate to the other evidences that are out there and the other studies that have been published before that? So there is a resource available that's called uh, PubMed that uh, basically contains all the studies uh, related to medicine um, and also nutrition that have been published over the past five, ten decades. Um, and that's where we scientists uh, look for uh, and look at when we are trying to, uh, to find inf new information when we do a literature study on, on a particular topic. So I've also used that as a basis for some of the, uh, the parts of the, uh, the MOOC, especially when it relates to uh, nutrition and health, for instance, the impact of artificial sweeteners or saturated fat uh, and, and, and heart disease. Um, I just want to use that as an example. If you would type in saturated fat in, in uh, PubMed, you get over 400,000 entries. So there's a huge number of publications on this topic, but this includes studies where they incubated cells with saturated fat. Um, and that's not necessarily informative if, if you want to know more about heart disease. So you can add the term heart disease, and then you lower the number uh, quite a bit. You get to about 19,000, which is still a huge number. Um, so you can't look at all these studies. So what you then do is you can introduce the term review. And a review is basically a summary of the research that is out there. And um, so people try to collect uh, a number of studies or the various studies that are available and, and try to come up with a, with a general conclusion. And um, some of those reviews are still, can be, still be a little bit biased. Uh, and a better way to do it is a so-called systematic review. It is a little bit more rigid. There are certain criteria on how to do that. And, and then you can get a better view of, of what is out there, what, what is the evidence. Um, if you take it one step further, you get to what we call a meta-analysis. And that question was also raised. What is a meta-analysis? Uh, now, what you do in a meta-analysis is that you uh, collect the various data uh, from different studies and you analyze them, you reanalyze them together. Yeah? So basically, you put everything in one big Excel sheet and analyze them together. And that's... Uh, that's really beneficial because you now have uh, many more people. Uh, if you, for instance, you're interested in the relationship between calcium supplementation and bone health uh, or bone density, uh, there have been quite a number of studies that have looked at that where people were given calcium and uh, they had their bone density measured after uh, several years. Uh, so a so-called trial, an intervention study. Um, but you can look at one of those studies, but you can also try to combine the data from the various studies that have followed this, this type of research design. Uh, so you have 1,000 people from one study, 4,000 people from another study, and, and 3,000 people for an, from another study. Now you combine them all and you analyze them together. So you have more people and you get more reliable estimates of the effect, uh, in this case, of calcium on, uh, on bone health. So that's what we call a meta-analysis, and it's, it's a really good source of information. And, and I've uh, often relied on the results of these so-called meta-analyses uh, to, to, um, yeah, to present information. Huh? So our information is, is often based on these meta-analyses uh, on, on, on various relations that are discussed in the MOOC, whether it's about uh, omega-3 fatty acids or saturated fat uh, and numerous other themes. Um, so also, if you're interested and, and you want to dig a little bit further and you want to look uh, on, on PubMed, then use the, the search term meta-analysis to, to get to these type of studies. And uh, they give you more general conclusion based on the, uh, yeah, the, in, the whole set of evidence that is available, as opposed to just one single study. So that's what I wanted to say about the, the process of, of uh, discovery. If you have more questions about that, just don't hesitate to ask them on the forum and we'll, uh, we'll try to address them. Uh. Now what I also wanted to do was address some of the claims, uh, some of the outrageous claims that were uh, put either on the discussion forum or that were um, put on the Food for Health app. And uh, there are a few of them that I want to discuss that were especially outrageous. And the first one is about uh, something that was called bulletproof coffee. And it is coffee with added butter. Now, personally, I don't drink coffee, uh, so I think it's disgusting anyway. But uh, I would think coffee with added butter would be even more disgusting. But anyway, 
It supposedly contains two tablespoons of unsalted grass butter, uh, which I assume is butter obtained from cows that were feed, fed on grass, and one tablespoon of medium-chain triglycerides. And supposedly the, um, the grass butter is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, which may be true, uh, at least they may contain more than just regular butter, but I would like to leave the, uh, the omega-3 fatty acids aside and concentrate on the other source, which is a tablespoon of medium-chain triglycerides. And there's a lot of discussion about medium-chain triglycerides. They're a little different. Uh, we didn't address them, in, uh, and we won't address them uh, in the week on, on, on fat, but there are sort of special fats that are uh, metabolized a little differently. Uh, and it's true that they're not directly transported to the fat tissue as normal fats are. Uh, they're delivered to the, to the liver. And for some people, that's a reason to argue that uh, they're just burnt. They're automatically burnt, and you can't store them as body fat. And that is, that is actually completely wrong. Uh, sugar is also not directly transported uh, to your fat stores, but still, it can contribute to fat gain, and, and we know that very well. So the notion that just because it's transported to the liver first is the reason why it cannot be stored as body fat is, is completely false, and I just wanted to make uh, that emphasis. Uh, so don't believe any of those claims on, on medium-chain triglycerides. They do have value in clinical uh, medicine where they're used for, for certain applications, but that, that's, that's beyond the scope of what we want to discuss now. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, the second claim... Okay, guys, can you be a little bit quiet? We're doing a recording here. Can you turn on the television? Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, these kids, they... Uh, yeah, well, we're having a recording here, and they did, of course, this is the first time they're not used to it, so... Um, fortunately, they turned it down. Uh, I'm not sure what they're watching, some, some kind of movie... Uh, anyway, uh, the second claim is about a, a patch, a patch that you supposedly wear uh, at night, no, actually 24 hours a day, and it, it's claimed to be coated with a unique blend of ingredients that are slowly absorbed throughout the day and night into your skin in a so-called transdermal process. Of course, uh, nobody knows what's in those patches, and nobody knows what are the active ingredients. I don't think there are any ingredients, because the idea that a patch would do that, this is, of course, this is not nutrition. Um, but of course, in this case, again, the, the, or this is an example where a company hides against some sort of secrecy and then makes a sort of gimmick tool that, that, that sounds really nice. Uh, but if it sounds too good to be true, then, then it, it, it usually is. Uh, it says uh, that it's more effective than oral administration, uh, transfer 95% of the ingredients into your body. You have no clue what those ingredients are, so there's no way to figure out if those ingredients are actually... Uh, effective and, and what they do. So I would be very careful. It's a unique blend of ingredients. Again, huh? the, 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 the customer, the client is left in limbo about what this actually is. So um, it's a very clever marketing tool and, and I'm sure a lot of people fall for it, but just be careful uh, with this type of stuff. Now the last claim is about uh, salt. We had uh, somebody um, put up a posting and it said, for many years, doctors are telling us that we have to cut down our salt intake because too much salt is bad for us and could cause a wide ver variety of health problems. However, this claim says that cutting down on salt can actually increase the risk of dying from a heart attack or stroke. Now, so that, that claim suggests that, that salt would be good for you. And, and actually, there's no evidence at all for this. Um, and there are a number of organizations, uh, lobbying groups, that try to defend the interest of, of salt uh, because their, their livelihood depends on it, but in fact, uh, uh, the evidence from numerous scientific studies is very clear-cut, uh, and it is obvious that we need to reduce our salt intake, and there are num numerous initiatives that are undertaken all throughout the world to try to accomplish that. Now, when we don't address salt in, in detail in, in this course. There will be a follow-up uh, to this course, uh, probably by the end of the year, where we'll address salt in more detail, but I want to raise it here because it illustrates the, the, the role of certain lobbying groups. And they're lobbying groups for salt, they're lobbying groups for saturated fat, and they're lobbying groups for uh, olive oil, for omega-3 fatty acids, and they all defend uh, their interest. And of course, they're biased. And it's our role as, as scientists to try to uh, provide a more balanced view. And it's not necessarily easy. Uh, because these organizations are often very effective, they're very clever, have great marketing tools, 
uh, to try to spread uh, their message. But be aware of that uh, and uh, be especially um, careful with messages that come from these type of lobbying organizations.